Before we begin the episode, I would like to thank our sponsor, Chin Up Goggles, the new generation of vision training. Its simplistic design eliminates downward vision, improving a player's spatial awareness, anticipation, skill acquisition and execution. The findings have been supported by scientific research in CIT, now MTU. Be sure to visit chinupgoggles.com for more. Welcome back to the Sideline Live podcast. You can follow us over on Twitter and Instagram at the Sideline Live. We'd love to hear from you. On episode 56, I am delighted to be joined by Connacht Rugby Head Coach Andy Friend. We discuss feedback, individual versus team improvement, skills, the importance of relationships, learning from other sports and so much more. I thoroughly enjoyed chatting with Andy, so I hope you enjoy the episode. Hi Andy, thanks a million for joining me on the podcast. Pleasure, Ola. Good to be here. So delighted to have you on to chat about all things coaching. Uh, So starting off, how do you think your career as a player has uh, impacted you as a coach and your coaching style? Well, that was many years ago. Um, It definitely helped me. Like, yeah, I think uh, I'm of the view that you probably have to have played the game in order to be able to coach it uh, because it just gives you the, um, you know, the little insights and nuances around the game. Uh, Okay. I definitely... Playing the game definitely helped me. Um, but as I said, that was many moons ago. So I've been coaching now for 20, 27 years professionally. So it's probably 20, 29 years since I stopped playing. Yeah, long time. Um, I, I'm interested there. I actually had a debate um, on my Instagram page on social media a while ago about that. Does it, is, do coaches um, need to be a player? And you said there, it's the nuances you think that make that difference when you're a head coach with playing experience. Yeah, I don't think you have to have played at the elite level. In fact, I know you don't, you don't have to have played at the elite level. But, you know, for, for example, for me to go in and let me pick a sport, synchronised swimming, I've never done synchronised swimming. For me to go in and coach synchronised swimming would would be very, very difficult because I just haven't done it. I don't know what, what people are feeling when they're underneath the water and I just don't, you know, I don't have a feel for that sport. So yeah, I think I think you have to have played the game if, if said, at whatever level. Okay. Um, it doesn't have to be at the elite level, uh, and in fact, sometimes I think that can, you know, that can damage you if you played at the elite level, um, because there's a perception because you're a great player, you're now going to be a great coach, which yeah. doesn't always ring true. So, um, you know, and unfortunately in rugby, as as in a lot of other sports, there seems to be a real push to get elite players into coaching, and and sometimes it works, but I think more times it doesn't work. Okay, interesting. And you mentioned a couple of different sports there. Do you ever look to other sports and kind of maybe look at other coaching styles or maybe visit sessions? Uh, I did reach out to Adrian O'Sullivan, a Dublin Camogie coach, and he said to say hello. I know you. He had a, you had him down for a session before. Yeah, no, and we do. We um, yeah, forever looking at at different sports and trying to learn different things mm-hmm. um, because every sport has its has its uniqueness about it. Uh, yeah, for example. Um, when I was uh, at the Waratahs uh, again a, a few years ago, now we we uh, we got in the Australian uh, volleyball coach, and, okay. and that was that was all around how do they get maximum height off of a very short run up, which is what we want to do in a line out. We want to try and get maximum power, mm-hmm. so they had this step and a half bang, and, and up they went. So he did a lot of work on our on our forward players with their line out stepping. Um, in order to initiate a movement of, of going up, which okay. I thought was, you know, it was actually a skill that a lot of people may not assimilate with rugby union, but it was very much a, a volleyball skill being able to spike at the net mm-hmm. or get up high in order to block a spike, which is exactly what we want, just, you know, immediate impact vertical height mm-hmm. in a, a line out. So, um, you know, I've used volleyball coaches before, AFL coaches for kicking, uh, rugby league coaches for tackling, uh, football coaches, soccer coaches for spatial awareness, mm-hmm. netball coaches for hand-eye coordination, cricket coaches for, for similar, um, and then and then touched on a whole range of different, you know, going to other sports. And one of the beauties of coming over here to Ireland, opening up to a whole new array of sports, the GAA, where, again, great athletes, um, and you can yeah. go and learn some, some great things off their coaching and, and what they're doing. Absolutely. What do you make of GEA and 
uh, not only the skill, as you say, like I'd say watching hurling for the first time, you were nearly blown away with the skill level. But the fact that it's an amateur sport with professional um, commitments, what do you make of it? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm overly um, knowledgeable in the game. Uh, like I've only watched it for three years. But again, like having been a sports lover, you get to pick up the trends of the game. And mm-hmm. uh, I just love, I, I love the hurling. I just think that's amazing. That is an amazing sport and amazing athletes with what they do. Um, the football is not too dissimilar to AFL. It's different in that it's a round ball and there's a few different rules there. But again, you know, I love any any good contest, but I am always, uh, I do admire the the amateurism of it, yet the the professional nature in which the players obviously condition themselves and, and the coaching that goes on there. Mm-hmm. Um, the camogie similar. Like it's just it's just it's just a great uh, you know spectacle of sport. Um, that unfortunately unless you've come to Ireland, you, it's you not really exposed. It. No, it's not, yeah. not really exposed in other areas of the world. So um, I'd heard about hurling before, but I actually honestly I had that confused with lacrosse i thought it was the same oh, okay thing. Um, it's definitely not uh, i had i've been much more aware of the football because of the the link with the afl yeah uh, and I play that that abbreviated version it just ends up in it should be a boxing match instead of a game of football but, so i had i'd seen that sort of thing before but um you know to see both of the games now live uh yeah it's, it's brilliant it's great mm-hmm. great sport over your years coaching, um, how have you evolved since beginning up to now? Uh, have you noticed a massive change in your approach? Has what has stayed similar, and how do you think you've changed over the over the years? Well, there's definitely been a, a, a massive change. I mean, it, you know, just even looking at the at the roles that I, I started when I first started coaching, I was a skills coach, so my whole okay. focus was on individual skill, and and I saw the game through a through a microscope, if you like. I could have told you at the end of a game, <clears throat> if I was working with a halfback, I could have told you uh, every pass that, that he did well um, and why he did it well. I could have told you the passes where he didn't go so well, what it was with his foot position. Wow. If you had to ask me now, I don't see any of that because I'm now looking at the, the bigger picture. So I think through the course of my coaching career and my coaching journey, the different roles uh, probably dictate how you watch the game so yeah. I was a skills coach and then into an attack coach or into a backs coach sorry into an attack coach into a defense coach into a head coach and the the, the you know the, the more you move up the ladder there the broader your your view on the game becomes mm-hmm. um, and now I'm surrounded by really good coaches that I give them uh, you know free reign to, to to delve into the detail but if you to ask me now you know, to delve into the detail. I could go back and look at it if I chose to, but I don't have the time yeah. to do that. So I now I now take a probably a wider strategic view of the game and, and the way I, I look at uh, look at training and look at the week um, and, and, you know, opposition previews and, and game reviews. So very, very different. And then just as a, as a person, uh, you know, as we, as we grow older, as we, we mature, we probably... We slow down. You'd like to think you slow down in terms of your haste to get to the next spot. Doesn't mean that I'm any less competitive. Yeah. Doesn't mean that um, yeah, I'm any less driven. It just means that uh, I've got a greater. I, I don't need to get there yesterday, if you like. Whereas before, as a young coach, you know, I wanted everything yesterday. Um, not even tomorrow. I wanted it yesterday. I wanted it to happen. And you know, life's not like that. You, you've got to take time and. You know, there's the saying, rain wasn't built in a day. It's not built in a day. And, and just over time, if you become patient and you just have your key processes and principles in place mm-hmm. and you're prepared to work hard and stick at something, uh, eventually you'll, you'll, you'll reap the rewards. Mm-hmm. I'm interested that you mentioned the skills coach there. Um, how much of the elite level game is down to the fundamentals of the sport and what we learn as, as kids? And why I ask that is my background's GEA. And yeah. I go out to a lot of games, particularly underage games, and the amount of times I see these big tactical plans, particularly around finals, and you've got all these words shout from the sideline, but the players aren't executing the fundamentals. I get the sense that we're just, I don't know what your opinion is, but we're just, at the underage level in particular, we're just jumping to the fancy tactical side rather than the fundamental the fundamentals of the sport. Yeah, and I think it's a really key point. I was only having this discussion with someone the other day um, 
just around you know what are the what are the formative years of of our of our life and it's between the ages of eight and 12 where you will form most of your habits um, mm -hmm. some of them bad and some of them really good and some of them really so it's a, it's a really fertile period of time to ingrain some really key skills whether that's just in life or whether it's in your sport mm -hmm. so and the best example i've ever heard on this was when when the russian gymnastics program was going so well in the in the late 80s early 90s there was a few other factors we now know at play there but yeah. um, the best coach in russia started at the under under eights the second best coach in russia started at the under nines yeah. and the third best under the tens and, and so it went on so the best learning was was being given to the athletes at the younger age so by the time they got up to 16 17 18 all the fundamentals had been ingrained mm -hmm. whereas in the western world we seem to flip it on its head you know we we tend to have your most experienced coaches be the pro coaches and they sit up the top end yeah. and your your least experienced coaches keep dripping down the chain and get down there to the under six, under seven, under eight, under nine, under 10, mm -hmm. when that's the most formative time to be delivering these key messages. So, you know, I think, again, um, if we were really smart with the way we developed our kids in terms of, uh, you know, their skill acquisition and, and just their habit forming, we would have the best educators at that younger age, anywhere between eight and 12, form those good habits, whether they be eating habits, sleeping habits, recovery habits, um, enjoyment habits, uh, how to kick a footy, hold a, hold a, a, a slither. So is that right? I think yeah, it is. it is. Yeah, good man. <laughs> um, you know, whatever the sport is, you know, teach those basic fundamentals there because that then becomes your habit that becomes yeah. ingrained. Yeah. And a bit like all of us, you know, when you're not thinking how to walk or how to, how to run or how to, how to, you know, ride a bike because you did that at those formative years and, and and now you can do that now you can start to tighten those things up but yeah um yeah i i think uh I, i'd have to agree with you i think um there's there's a lot of uh focus on the tactical stuff and, and i've been involved with underage coaching before some of it when i first started coaching but also you know often i go down to more so in Australia when I had a bit more time, to be honest. But I'd go down to schoolboy matches and I'd, I'd sit there and I'd, I'd listen in to, to coach speak. And, uh, you know, it's not about what the Brumbies did last night on the telly. Did you not see that line out? Well, these are professional athletes that train. Just yeah. teach me how to catch catch and pass and run square and, and tackle, put my head on the right position and, and you know, how to do the, 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 the basic skills of the game of rugby, which is the game that, that we're talking about here. So... I think we need to spend a lot more time at the junior level with our better coaches, to be honest. Yeah, I totally agree there. Um, I had a brilliant co uh, question in from a Twitter account, GEA Coach Quotes. Um, how much time do you as a group spend on the fundamentals as opposed to, as we just said, the um, gains base and tactical sessions? Uh, if I was to give you a percentage, I would say at least 80% of our stuff okay. is just on the fundamentals. Um, and most of our play is, or most of our training is based around unstructured play. So it's not structured play okay. <clears throat> because that's, that's actually where most of the play happens. Um, but that's not normal. You know, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of set piece stuff, a lot of structured stuff within the game of rugby. And I've been guilty of it in the past as a coach, um, but it was a fair while ago where, you know, 80% of your training is based upon getting this line out player right and this scrum player right and yeah. this restart right. You have to have a look at some of those things, but the game's not based around scrums, line outs and, 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 and restarts. It's based mm -hmm. around open or key principles of play, mm -hmm. you know, catching square, running square, being able to draw a man, getting off the line hard in defence, bodies in front, all the rest of it. So we spend the majority of our time now, I'd say about at least 80%, on those key fundamentals and, and trying to ingrain those in everything that we do. Okay, interesting. Um, I'm a kind of a skills coach, I guess, in GEA, and what I'm trying to discover, and I've asked a couple of people about this um, outside of the podcast, but how do you balance improving individuals versus a team? And I know with Connacht Gear Setup, you would have, let's say, multiple coaches to help you, but for coaches that maybe don't have that major setup, how do you, and from your experience as a skills coach, how difficult is it to balance the two together at the same time? Well, I think they're, they're intrinsically linked too, because, you know, if you just think about it, 
um, logically, if, if individuals get better, the team gets better. So um, I, I think one of the key things we can uh, we can teach our players, uh, our athletes, is is how to be self sufficient. And I often say this to coaches. I reckon the best coaches are the ones that um, by the end of the year, if they're heading to the this will sound this will sound really morbid, but if they're heading to the <laughs> the final and they get hit by a bus and they don't turn up the team's still going to function because yeah. they don't actually need you there you've ingrained all the key learning attributes and and fundamentals and the habits as to how they can go about being the best versions of themselves um, you've ingrained that over the course of the 12 months you've had them or the eight months nine months whatever it is so i reckon our job as coaches is but I, and i don't think this actually I think a lot of coaches, and I certainly was one at the time, you want to be, um, you don't want to be redundant, right? So you want to make sure that they need you, your players need you. Yeah. Because if you're not there, you don't have a job, right? <laughs> so, but I reckon if we flip that and it's actually my job is, my job's actually to, to be really super organized that, that I, and, 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 and clever in the way I educate these folks that at the end of the season, they don't need me. And if I can do that, I've been a really successful coach. Mm-hmm. So how can I ingrain those habits and skills into the into the players? Well, the first thing at the end of the day, I'm not here to design your skill program. What I am here to do is to check in that you know how to plan a week and you know what your key fundamentals are that you want for that week. So one of the things that you know we have there on it now, we have the players deliver a journal or they have they have the opportunity to. Not everyone does it, but our best players tend to do it. Okay. Where, and some of them sent it to me on the Sunday night that says, for any, here's what I want to do this week. And it's what I want to, the, the three key things I want to get out of the week. Here's what my Monday is going to look like. Here's what I'm going to do on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, into the game. If I get selected, here's how I want to play. Now, that's that's been built over the course of the last few years. And we've actually got, I'm going to, I'm going to say about 40 to 50% of our players do that. Now, we've got another chunk, an old okay. dog new tricks they're hard to change yeah but so a lot of our younger blokes where they're coming through and that's what they're doing so i'm sitting there going brilliant i might go back with a couple of comments looks good if you thought about this you thought about that so at the end of the day they're they're the master of their own destiny and we're there to 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 to, to guide and support yeah and that's why we're called support staff we're there to, to support the player and i continue to say to players the best coach you'll ever have is you you're the best coach you'll ever have our job is to teach you how to be the best version of that and to teach you about your best habits and, and goal setting and planning and, and and reflection and staying on top of that, recovery, all those other things. We're, we're here and you'll fall off the tree every now and then and we'll pick you back up and put you back on it. That's our job. So it's a long way of answering your question, but if we can zone in on all the individuals and make them the best at managing their own destiny, then our team's going to be better. And then all we've got to do as coaches is try and blend that together to get the best version out of these these new performing athletes and then hopefully a better performance at the end of the day. I love that journal um, thing you mentioned there. When did you kind of come up with that idea? And have you noticed, I know not everyone does it, but since the players maybe over a long, long-term long period have, have done it, have you noticed a difference maybe in their approach to their performance and their week? Oh, totally. We... We, we actually put a lot of time in it over COVID during that lockdown period of a year and a half ago now. And we came out of COVID, we had a little working group. You know, what would our journal look like? What, what do you blokes want um, okay. in your journal? And so we had the player input with that. Um, at the time, we, we got a, a, a performance skills coach come in, a guy by the name of Jack Burke. So that sort of became his area to educate the players on, on how, to, um, how to best manage themselves during the course of the week. It could be on... You know, it could be on simple, a simple thing, but how to do journaling. It could be on how to how to how to be reflective. It could be on visualization. It could be on relaxation. It could be skills under pressure. All of that sort of stuff. So all of that mind stuff, um, which you know we could call in the, the the mind coach if we like, but it's a performance skills we call it. Um, so Jack's come on board with that, uh, and the uptake has been slow, but it's been gradual. Uh, and what I'm seeing now is that. Um, because what used to happen, or there was, um, and I think this happens in most sports, the player rocks up to the training and the coach says, here's what we're doing today. And the player goes, yeah, right. Eh? And off they go and go and do it. Now they'll get some learning out of that, 
But wouldn't it be brilliant if the player rocks up the trains and his own mind, he says, well, today there's three things I need to work on. In attack, I've got to work on my foot speed into contact. In defence, I've got to work on my body in front and finish in the tackle. And and generally, I just want to work on, on you know, continuous movement and staying in motion. So it doesn't matter what the coach throws at me. They're the three things that I'm going to zone in on today. And that could be very different for all, you know, for, for the 43 players that we've got. Yeah. So regardless of what we throw at them, the players have got things that they're already zoned in on what they need to pick up. Yeah. So you've now got a player coming in with a genuine focus as to, as to what he wants to, to work on. You've got the coach who's put a lot of preparation, the coaching staff put a lot of preparation and time into what this session looks like. And now we combine the two. And we've got a really purposeful training session now, as opposed to coach turning up going, here's the session. The bloke goes, yep, sweet. I know I've got to do some attack defence. He doesn't know. He's not zoning on anything. And then when he goes to review the session, at the end of end of the session, if you're not planned going into it, when you go to review that session and you know, we, we provide video um, or vision of all of our sessions, Okay. I'd say 60, 70% of the players go and watch it. There's still a portion that don't go and watch it. Yeah. Uh, but now if you've, if you've gone in saying, well, my key things are footwork, body in front, staying in motion, when I'm reviewing that session, that's all I'm looking for. I'm just looking for those things. The coach will come back. If there's anything else, the coach might come back and support me with that but or let me know either what I did really well or what I didn't do really well. But I've now got something really tangible that I can manage myself or I can, I can reflect upon and say, did I do that? Yeah. So, you know, it sounds really simple and it is really simple, but... Um, it takes a long, long time to get players and and even coaches into that mindset that that would be the in my mind that'd be a really purposeful, powerful session if we could do that. Yeah, I, I, what I love there is just what you're saying. And I had a question down: how much responsibilities do you give your players? You seem to give them a lot. And what I love about it, it's all self-driven. And as you said, like someday you might not even have to show up to training because the players are just going to drive everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And as I said, you know, if, if heaven forbid something happened to us where we couldn't turn up to training, I would suggest that our training sessions would still be pretty successful. They'd still flow and there'd be a there'd be an element of players just taking over. And we actually give some of the sessions just to the players. Okay. You know, we have line out sessions. We say, boys, that's on you. We give them due warning. So we might tell them the night before, tomorrow you've got you got a 30 minute session. You go and take that. You okay. tell us what you want to get through. Um, we don't do it for attack defense. We do with our clarity stuff. With the clarity stuff, the players just want to take that. You know, I used to be in a, the only other job I've had. I was an outward bound instructor. So I won't bore you with the details of that. But pretty much, you're taking people on a journey on an eight day to twenty six day journey where it's a group of people who've never met before, but you want to get them from point A to point B. With where you're camping out in the bush, you're, you're bushwalking, you're rafting, you're mountain climbing, you're abseiling, doing that sort of stuff. So. The, the first three, I always said, the first third of, of what, however long that journey was, the first third of that was mostly me as the instructor, right? So that's me giving you guys or giving the group the background on what they need to do to survive out in the bush, but also to, to navigate properly, do all of that. Yeah. So I'm purely instructing. So that's me instructing. The middle third of that journey that we were on, there's i'll call it mentoring you guys can take some leadership i'll guide you you can ask some questions and we'll play off each other we'll feed off each other and the last third of that is it's over to them now i'm there to support so i'd call that pure coaching really i'm not going to give you the answer i'll ask you key questions so when you say we're going the right way friendly i'll say are we on a ridge line and you'll say yes or no we're not on a ridge line where's the next nearest ridge line because you know staying on the ridge line is the right way to do it i'm not going to tell you whether you're going the right way or not if we get lost well I'm get, i'll get lost with you but i know i can get ourselves out of that and it's very similar to coaching yeah it's actually very similar to parenting it's the exact same <laughs> so a lot of instruction early on middle bit there we're going to work together on this last bit this is you yeah. you know you're there to, to catch me if they fall but by the time they get to the end of the journey um i.e the game day on saturday yeah. If they win, they've got this feeling that that was me or that was yeah. us. Yeah. We don't need you, blokes. And you go, brilliant. That's great. Yeah. Right. Rather than we need the coach. If the coach isn't here, we're going to lose. And when they when they win, for example, the coach goes, that was me. Yeah. And you go, yeah. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It shouldn't be about you. You had your time in the sun. That was years ago. This yeah. is about you now the players and how well they did. So, um, yeah, that 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 stuck with me out of outward bound, and it's a way. 
I'm not going to say we do that every week, but there's, that's definitely the trend that we try and work with, mm-hmm. where we give responsibility. And by the end of the week, the players are the ones that are leading. I love that. I had a question in from a previous uh, coaching podcast guest, um, Paul Kelleher. He's the Irish under-18 men's basketball coach. He wants to know, how do you manage deep squads? Like you mentioned there are 43 players. I know Paul, they'd have a selection of 12 players going abroad. How do you connect with those 43 players? Because that's, that's quite a large number. It is a large number. Um, and it's tricky. It's not easy because well, how do I connect with them? I, I, I give everybody the same amount of time. Okay, so every it doesn't matter whether you you know player one to player forty three, you're in our squad. I'm going to give you time, and I'm going to, I do care about you, and I'm going to zone in on you and try and you know work to to learn as much as I can about you and what makes you tick and what your key aspirations are and your desires are and targets are. Um, so that doesn't change whether you player one or player forty three or staff member, you know head of head of operations to. To kit man, they're all, you know, they're, we're all part of this. So everyone yeah. gets, in my mind, I attempt to, do I do it? You'd have to ask the players, but I attempt to share my time amongst everybody there. Mm-hmm. The tricky bit with managing them is everyone, the players anyway, one to 43, they want to play footy. And unfortunately, because of COVID um, and where we currently sit, we, we've had, we haven't had a lot of rugby for them. So mm-hmm. you've got these blokes who are really good at this sport. But they just have had a limited opportunity. We've got a couple of fellas who you know, haven't played for eight months. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean they're not good footballers. It just means at the minute we're just not, you know, we, we feel like we've got players who are playing better ahead of them. So how do they then how do they then improve themselves? And what's the key messaging when they come in? Because as humans, what we tend to do is uh, we're not selected. And the first thing that goes through your mind is coach doesn't rate me. And it's like, no. Well, sometimes we might not, and if we don't, we'll tell you. Yeah. We will. We will be that blunt. So, no, your performance at the moment is not good enough, and mm-hmm. we're not selecting you because of that. But there's other players there who are training out of their skin. Like the, you know, we got a couple of fellas, best I've ever seen them train. They're hitting PBs in gyms. They're training the house down in the footy field. They never stop trying. They're doing their key extras. They're doing you know, all their work ons, and they're zoned in on everything. They're doing their journal, and they're knocking on the door, going, you know, what are you thinking, friend? I said, well, you tell me. What, what do you think I'm thinking? Do I think you're training well? Well, I'd hope you. Yeah, I am. I think you're training brilliantly, mate. Um, when can I get my chance? When do you reckon you get your chance? Probably when player ahead of me gets injured or has a really bad game. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I actually love what you're doing. I think you've been brilliant. But at the moment, we've got a bloke sitting ahead of you who he's doing really well too, but he's only doing well because you're keeping the pressure on him. So keep the yeah. pressure on and be ready because your chance will come, something will happen, and when you get that chance, be ready for that. Yeah. And make it that we get into the next selection meeting and we go, we can't not pick him now. He's been yeah. brilliant. And we and actually there's we've got a player um, who's just gone through that. Oh, shit, it's Norma Ray. Norma Ray was not even in our 23. And then a couple of games went by, there was an injury. He got snuck into our 23. And then there was another injury and he snuck into the starting team. And he has been absolutely outstanding the last two games against Munster and then against Ulster, our last, last performance. Mm-hmm. And he is now the first lock on the team sheet. I love and, that. Yeah. And you just go, well, we can't not have you. But, yeah. you know, five weeks before, he wasn't in the 23. But he stayed doing what he, you know, he stayed focused on his on his key role. He kept working hard. He didn't drop his bottom lip. He just said, no, no, my time will come. And it came. And then he performed and he delivered you other blokes got to try and get him out now. Yeah, that's the thing. You mentioned their injury. Um, how do you manage, I guess, the players and what's your relationship like with the medical and strength and conditioning staff? Because I guess, in, particularly with, with a sport like rugby, it's it's a very important relationship to maintain throughout the season. Well, I think every relationship within the team is important. So, again, similar as I said there before, you know, my, my time... Um, I try and spend it equally amongst everybody. So as I said, I've got a great relationship with our kit man. He's actually the heartbeat of our team. Brilliant. Um, our medical staff, there's a there's a, uh, a brilliant relationship there um, where we're constantly in contact and, and working with them. We've got Barry O'Brien who runs out. Uh, he's the head of rehab. So there's a great relationship there. I reckon the, um, you know, the injury stuff's hard. And I reckon one of the things that we've added this year, which has added real value, um, our skills coach, skills and, and backs attack coach, Marcy Lawler, is spending time. He came into the program new this year 
Uh, and one of his observations, ha having been an academy coach, was I just reckon, you know, he, he'd been watching because he'd been in the academy program. He'd been watching the way we managed the, the squad the previous three years. And his feedback was, I just don't think you spent enough time with the injured players, which is really good feedback. Okay. So, so how do we fix that? He said, well, I'm going to do skills with them every other day. Sweet. So he's now doing that. Our, our injured players love it. They love the fact that there's a coach now giving them attention. One of the things we were doing, we had this thing called a brekkie club because I'm aware that if you've got injured players, uh, you can lose connection with them because they're not involved in, in, in all your key sessions. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, front end of the week, our heads are on the review of the previous game, the preview of the, opposite, of the, of the next opposition coming up. Um, so what we used to do was on a Friday when really for a coach, um, it's your down day. You know, it's a day before a game. It's, in my mind, it's our down day. Okay. So now I can start to spend time somewhere else. So in my first year here and up until COVID, we were coming in at 7 o'clock on the Friday morning, training with our injured players and then going for brekkie with them. And we go okay. down, we call it brekkie club, and we go down to the Huntsman just near us and we, we, you know, there might be a table of 14 of us unfortunately sometimes have a lot of injuries might be part of 14 of us and we're sitting there just having and having brekkie and just having a chin wag and just catching up doesn't have to be about footy just how are you going how's your girlfriend what happened last weekend and you know social life and whatever it is just catching up and at the end of the year when we sought feedback from the players one of the things they loved was the fact that we had this brekkie club where you know they they understood as an injured player um, there's going to be a period of isolation for them, but mm -hmm. that was still very much a part of our thinking. Um, COVID then put a bit of a, a stop to that. We've done a couple of those this year, mm -hmm. but I think the key thing we've added to it this year is Mossy coming in and doing those skills with the players, and they absolutely love it. Um, people just want attention. People just want to continue to try and get better. And I don't think it's never a nasty thing if we're not thinking of them. It's just it's, it's a time thing and it's a management thing, but... You know, you you, uh, you could do yourself huge favors as a coach to to make sure you're investing time into your injured players because they're still a, an integral part of your squad. Absolutely, I'm only back from a major injury myself, so I understand from a player's perspective. But as you said, the coach there, like you've so much time doing so many things. Sometimes it is hard. Um, I'm interested in the the feedback you mentioned there at the end of the year. What sort of questions are you asking players, and what areas are you looking for feedback in? Yeah, um, well, we uh, at the end of every year, we, we, we do a review. We do a review of, of all the areas within the program uh, and we do seek players' feedback on that too. Um, our exiting players, we actually zone more in on those guys, to be honest with you, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, yeah, they're, they're exiting and more times than not, it's not their call to be exiting. It's normally their club's call. Um, it may have been injury, may have been you know, lack of form or getting to an age. Every now and then, though, you've got a player who's moving on to something better. So, but regardless of what they're, what they're, why they're exiting, uh, whatever you know, however long they've been within the program, it's been a major part of their life. So, I think it's really important that you give them the opportunity to have a final say and to share their thoughts. So, um, that always happens one on one with me. Um, due to COVID, it happens over Zoom, but prior to that, it was face to face. <clears throat> and I'd always share with them six or seven questions. You know, questions like what. Uh, what's the proudest thing that, that that you've done during your time here at Comet? Um, you know, what's uh, what would you say to somebody coming into Comet Rugby? Uh, what would be a key thing both on and off the football field that you think we should keep doing? What would be a key thing both on and off the football field that you think we need, we need to change? What would be, you know, one key bit of critical feedback that you'd provide me as a coach? How could have I been better for you? And so on and so forth. So, um, it's always about a half hour to 45 minute conversation. I get so much out of that uh, because, uh, again, part of the, you know, one of the things that players are exiting so they can feel they can be really honest. Um, actually, one of the other great questions is what staff member has been the biggest support for you during your time at Comet Rugby? Uh, and, and that response is brilliant because, you know, they'll call out staff members that I, I may not have been aware of that relationship. It could have been a physio because they've been injured a lot. So then I can pick up the phone to that physio and say, just an FYI, just got off the phone that I did my exit meeting with blah, blah. You were so powerful for them. So well done. Like you actually changed that, that person's 
time here and, and that's so then the, the, the staff member gets that and goes you beauty i must be on the right track yeah. so you know things like that are really really to me they're really powerful um, for the rest of the group we use the simple stop start keep so what do we need to stop doing start doing keep doing uh, a pretty simple one um, but i've used that for for the last uh, or probably for the last decade and and you always pick up some really good trades coming out of that Okay, interesting. Um, I have a question here for my uncle. Um, quick shout out to my uncle Cormac. Uh, he sees Connacht like Leicester in soccer. You work hard and have a great fan base, but how do you motivate the team to compete with the Liverpool and Man City of the world? They're actually the easy ones to compete against because you're up against the big ones. And and uh, I don't, I seriously don't feel like we have an inferiority complex. I think I tell you what, what's been tricky, and I think there is an element where we're changing that at the moment. Do we have genuine belief? I think we go into every game with genuine belief that we can compete. But when the going gets tough, and let's say they let's say we're up against a, a Leinster, and they go and throw two tries on us, uh, I reckon the hardest mindset to change is not every player, but there'll be a percentage of players to go. I knew that was going to happen. Well, no, you didn't. No, you didn't know that was going to happen. That's happened, but now let's let's not live in the past. Now we've got a. That's why we go back to performance skills coach. How can I disregard everything that's just happened there and still stay zoned in to say, well, the next however many minutes is left, or the next five minutes, I with all the training that I've done, I can actually be the best player on the football field. Mm-hmm. So how do I do that? And it starts at an individual level, and then we build that into the team confidence. So, as as you'd probably be aware. We haven't been the most consistent team, and most of most of our lack of consistency comes against teams where, you know, you read the team sheet, and with all respect to some team, you read it and you go, "Well, we should be beating them," but then so we drop off our preparation and our mental okay. application to the team, and and we we fall against the team that we it's going to be a tight battle. But we should be the better team. We tend to go okay against the bigger teams unless they get quick fire scores on us, you know, four or two or three in the first 15, 20 minutes. And then that, 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 uh, that bias comes in, the, the confirmation bias comes in to say, I knew that was going to happen. No, you didn't. Otherwise you'd, you know, you'd be making a million bucks, being a fortune teller. You didn't know that was going to happen, but it's happened, but we can still change that. So yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. Um, but again, I think it starts at the individual level. If every player knows that their preparation it comes down to journaling. Their preparation has been the best that they could have put in there. We are, we won't win every game, but if you can walk off that footy field and say, oh, I couldn't have done any more. I couldn't have done any more in my prep. I thought the way I prepared myself, the way I delivered, yes, I got a couple of things wrong as we all do in the game of footy but, or in life. But So those things happen. But otherwise, I'm really proud of the performance. I don't. We were just beaten by a better football team. That's okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had a question in from Michael on Twitter. Um, I see that Connacht are trying to move the ball at every opportunity, no matter where on the pitch. Is this an Australian flair you're trying to introduce? Oh, no, I'm not going to take credit for that. We, we've got a um, listen, a, a, as an Aussie, we, we, um, I was brought up um, playing on dry fields, on hard surfaces, and you know, the view was to move the football. So that is my philosophy on the game. And I'm also a really strong believer, as I say to people, why did William Webb Ellis pick up the soccer ball and run with it? He picked it up because he was so bored of this bloody kick, 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 and he hated the game of soccer. So he said, bugger it, I'm going to run. And so that's what he did. So to me, the game was born out of somebody that said, just run, just run with a ball. That's what we're meant to do. Yeah. So I have a real, I have a love affair for that because I think that that's the fundamentals of the game. That's why it first started. Um, but why I'm not going to take credit for it uh, if you do ask me, yes, that's the way I want the game played. But we've got a brilliant coaching group that's led by Pete Wilkins, um, who's our senior coach, and he he he's based his coaching philosophy and model on a very similar view, where it's all about he, he uses the term water. Um, we want to be like water, and water will always find a gap. So if you give us space, we get, water will move through it. So if you just think about you know water moving down a, a you know a, a, a river. And there could be big rocks in front of it, trees falls in front of it. Doesn't matter. There's change direction. They're going up the way. That's the way we like to play the game with uh, uh, Connex. That's been part of Connex DNA. But what's important now is we've got a coaching group, um, myself included, where that's the way we see the game that needs to be played. So, and we have a playing 
group that that that's that's what we're good at. That's what we yeah. recruit on. We recruit yeah. on players that have speed, and are brave. You know, have 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 the the capacity to be relentless, which is one of our key key game styles. Um, so we try and recruit that, and and that's what we deliver on the footy field. And it's good fun to watch. It's good fun to play. It's good fun yeah. to watch. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I listened to an interview you did recently and you were talking about uh, identity and style of the team. I'm, I'm pretty sure I have this right, but you mentioned three words, uh, fast, relentless and adaptable. Can you explain right. those three words and how you actually came up with those three? Well, again, it wasn't me solely that came up with it. Pete Wilkins and I um, and others had input into that over the course of the, the last preseason. Uh, and Connacht's, Connacht, Connacht's always had a style, I think, but... Could you pinpoint what it was? I think if you go back and have, have a look at their 2015-16 season when they won, they were definitely fast. Like they moved the ball around a lot and they had this tempo in the game. Um, they were dogged, right? So they didn't stop giving up and they were probably considered the underdog, but they just kept coming at you, coming at you, coming at you. Um, you know, and, and, and I think living in the West of Ireland, um, you have to be adaptable because things change all the time. So when we sat back and looked at it more holistically as to you know, what, when has Connacht been at its best? What do we think uh, represents our squad best? What, what, what can our players do and what can we deliver as coaches? They were the three words we came up with. We think fast because we're, we're, we're never going to be the biggest group, but we'll run you off your feet and we want to play at a tempo that will eventually tire you out. Mm-hmm. Um, relentless, that's just, you know, that's that Connacht spirit, you know, where you just don't give up. Uh, and adaptable we need to be able to change we need to be able to change our game style depending upon the weather depending upon the opposition the referee home and away all the rest of all those other things so we don't want to be stuck in this one system where you've only got plan a we've got plan a b c d e f if we choose to so we're quite happy to say well that's not working move to this next thing Um, but again that that's a mindset you know, you've, you've got to be able to train that. Otherwise, people get stuck in this one frame. Well, that's not working. No, it's not going to work because the opposition worked it out. Um, so we came up with it and say we, it was Pete, Pete and I and others came up with that. I think it's been really powerful for our group um, because everything we do now, whether it's in the gym, whether it's on the training field, whether it's the way we talk, everything is around that. We'll zone in on, we were brilliantly fast at that. Look at that. That's fast. Yeah. Look at that. That's relentless. Look at how we change there. That's adaptable. Similarly, if we haven't done that well, for example, in our last game against Ulster, um, we didn't adapt to the referee. We gave away 17 penalties, 11 in the first half. We didn't adapt. And the message at halftime was, fellas, we talk about being adaptable. We've come in 17-6 up, so it's not a bad half of footy. But the message was, what are we doing? We're not yeah. adapting here. You know, yeah. referees nailed us 11 times. We've got to take another half a step back from the defensive yeah. line. We're getting nailed there all the time. We went into the second half and 22 minutes in, we gave away our first penalty. But by that stage, the game, we've won the game because mm-hmm. we, our relentless pressure without relieving the pressure because of penalties allowed us to, to get the line breaks and to score the tries. That's where we won the game. We won the game by eventually adapting to what Andy Brace, the referee, the way he was adjudicating us. And we, we, weren't, smart, we weren't smart enough nor adaptable enough in the first half to, to realise that. So that worked for us there. Uh, James sent in a great question. I think it's very applicable for any coaches listening that aren't, let's say, from a rugby background. Um, respect and discipline in rugby is, is very big, especially towards officials. Uh, and from my background, that isn't always the case. How can other sports and coaches in particular replicate this discipline with their team? Well, I think first and foremost, the, you know, it's it, it's um, monkey see, monkey do. So if, if you're the coach, you have to be respectful. Right? So yeah. you can't be saying to your players, I need you to respect them. As soon as the referee plays a bad call, you, you go give him a bollock. You, know, you start yelling at him, telling him he's, you know, he's blind and needs a, a, a seeing eye dog or whatever it is. But, um, yeah, so you need, to, you need to understand that as the coach, you set the tone for that. Mm-hmm. Um, our sport is very, very big on it. So referee is still called sir. Most players, you know, excuse me, sir, you just call him sir because that's what we were brought up with. That becomes the habit of rugby. Um, I, I actually feel like the game, and I, we should never ever lose that because to me that's one of the beauties of our game that that, that that sets it apart. You know, at the end of the end of the day in life, we have people that try and keep the discipline, i.e., the police force mm-hmm. and the law. 
and they don't always get it right, but more times than not, they're there to, to support and to make sure that we live in a safe environment. And it's the exact same on a rugby field. Our policeman on the rugby field is the referee and his two assistants who's two deputies. And they're there to try and create a, an environment for us to exist in that's, that's safe and that's, that's even for, for, for everybody. They don't always get the, the things right, nor do we as coaches get every decision right on the game, but nor do, nor do the players. So don't hound him for the, for, the, you know, for the errors that they're making there on a continual basis. At the end of it, there's a review process. By all means, go through that. But I reckon you know, as soon as someone shows disrespect to a referee, you march them. If they do it again, you send them off. And that stops it pretty damn quickly. And I, like I'm actually a sports lover. I watch all sports. But that's one of the things that irked me about the game of soccer for so long. How the hell can a referee or an umpire, I think they call them there, a referee, how can they make a decision and have five blokes run up at it and tell them what they're doing wrong and be like, back away, mate. And in fact, if you don't back away, you're off the footy field <laughs> and your mate's off the footy field. And if you had a referee or an umpire strong enough to do that, you wouldn't have it happen, would you? Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't yeah. have it happen. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I've asked a number of guests this question. It's probably nearly my mission to get the answer, but without naming names, what separates the great players and the elite level players from the rest of the pack? Uh, I think there's a couple of things. I think um, their preparation is one. So to me, um, you know, we, I have a little saying I use with the, with the players, the board man gets paid. The B-O-R-E-D, the board man gets paid. So someone who, you know, because, you know, doing your stretching, doing sleeping right, eating right, um, doing your, your pre-game preparation, your mental preparation, your opposition preview, your reflective reviews, and so on and so forth. It, it can be boring. It's, you know, it can be tedious. Yeah. But if you continuously do that, that becomes your habit. Guess what? You're going to have, a, and, and you're any good at sport, you're going to have a pretty good career. So the board man gets paid. I reckon, you know, don't get bored of doing the simple things well. Most of us want to be flash, right? But the flash stuff comes when you become really, really good at something, then the flash stuff starts to happen. And just, you get into this flow and it just happens for you. So, so that'd be the first, the, the, the person that's, that's prepared. Uh, and then the other person who's got, that I think um, is successful is those that live in the present moment. So we all make errors. And I always say good players make errors, great players make errors and, and drop it straight away, get onto the next thing. But how many players do you see make the error and five minutes later still thinking about knock the ball on? Well, you can't change that. That yeah. happens, but let it go. So the capacity to be able to stay present in the moment and forget about what's just happened, own it, take yourself out of that moment now and say, I'll be better next time, then get into the new moment and then stay in that moment. Don't reflect upon that. Yeah. That, that'll turn you into a great player. So those two simple things to me, through my experience, the the great players are the ones that can do that. They Brilliant. don't get bored of doing the simple stuff and they stay present in the moment. Brilliant. Uh, what's been the biggest lesson you've learned from coaching or sports so far? Uh, that It's all about relationships. Okay. So, you know, it's not, a, it, there's an element of X's and O's and tactical, technical. But to me, the longer I'm in the game, this is a, this is a game around, relationships and about connection and about man management um so uh, which i think is what life's about at the end of the day life's about that life's about connecting with as many people as you can listening to many different views and, and, and thoughts and opinions on different things having your own views and being strong with those but being able to change um so sports taught me that sports taught me that uh You've got to be strong in what you think too, but you don't have to be rigid in that. You can always learn and, and tomorrow's another learning day or today's another learning day. So, you know, so never, ever stop learning. So oh, the, the, well, there's probably so many, it's a great question, but there'd be so many little um, you know, gifts and treats that that, uh, that that have been in this occupation has given me over time. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they'd be the, they're the first two that come to mind. If there's any coaches listening that do struggle with building that relationship, because I guess maybe from GEA, that wasn't always the case. It's probably the modern approach, as some people call it. What advice would you give to, to coaches to help them develop better relationships with their players? Uh, spend time, ask questions, 
and and I reckon the great, um, you know, it's a Stephen Covey, one of his seven habits of highly effective people. Habit number five, seek to understand before being understood, right? So everybody has a different view because everyone comes from a different walk of life. So when someone does something either really, really good or something that really irks you, there'll be a reason they've done that. So I reckon the key thing for you as a coach is not to judge that, but to spend time asking the question, what, why did that just happen? What's going on here? Why would you do that? Or, you know, it could be something really positive. That was brilliant. How did you get to that? How, what yeah. did you do to get to that? So understand where they're coming from. It tends to happen more when, when there's been an error or there's been a, you know, someone's continuously late to training or doesn't do what you're asking to do. Spend time trying to find out because there'll be a reason for it. Doesn't mean the player doesn't like you. Doesn't mean the player disrespects you. Doesn't mean the player doesn't care. There'll be a reason for that. And if you can spend the time trying to find out why that that event is happening, and now you can build a bridge to fix that, and you can build a bridge to say, ah, right, I'm with you on that. Now, can I help you with that? At the end of the day, it's up to the player. Sometimes you can you can do all the seeking you want, but you know, the player just doesn't want to change. That's fine. But at least you spent the time to find out what the reason was, and you mm-hmm. you throughout the olive branch whether they choose to take it or not it's up to them mm-hmm. but um yeah for me that that ability to to ask questions to seek to understand a person before you make judgment or without making judgment um i reckon that's key but you have to give it time and okay. everyone's different right so you know as i said i, I try and spend equal amount of time with all players some players it's on a Sunday post the game, we might have a half hour chat. There's probably three or four players that that's where I spend my time with them. Other players it's during the course of the week, whether it's just a sit down next to them in the change room, whether it's a make a coffee with them, whether it's a go for a meal with them, or maybe it's just a, te- a few text messages. Some, some players just respond better over text. Mm-hmm. There's a myriad of different ways you can do that, but try and find out your, the best form of connection and, 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 uh, and how you can have a relationship with people and spend time trying to work that out for each individual. Brilliant. I'm going to end the episode with the sideline seven. It's the same seven questions at the end of every episode. It's kind of a thought-provoking round, but you can take it whatever way you want. Uh, question one, what is your favourite quote? You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Brilliant. And do you use quotes much with the team at all? I used to. I used to. Um, and that one springs to mind because I've, I've used that. Uh, and probably, sorry, I've got another one for you. Which oh, go for it, mind. yeah. Um, if you believe you can or believe you can't, you're probably right. Love it. Uh, question two, best sporting event you've been to? Oh, I'd have to say it was a Bledisloe Cup match. In, oh, no, I'll say it's the, it's, uh, phew, uh, I'll say the World Cup final 2003 in Sydney. I was actually working for the Wallabies at the time. Now we lost, but it was just a brilliant event to be at. I was lucky enough to be at the the, the Rio Olympics too. That was pretty special. But uh, yeah, the, the 2003 World Cup final would, would have to be it. Is there any particular sporting event on your bucket list? Uh, Tour de France, 100%. Okay. And I'll get there. I'll get there. You will, you will. Uh, question three, big, biggest setback or challenge so far in your career and how did you react to it? Uh, would have to be getting sacked. I've been sacked twice. Um, and, and the first time was by far the hardest because I never envisaged that I was going to get sacked. And I didn't I didn't see it coming. Um, but, you know, it happens. And if you're a coach, it will happen to you. If you stay in the game long enough, you will get sacked. The thing that um, surprised me the most was was probably how invisible how invisible you became within, the num- within a, a number of like 24 hours pretty much. So again, because I was a young coach back then, it was 2004 and I'm thinking, you know, I've been sacked, I didn't see that coming, don't know what the next job is, got a young family, got the mortgage to pay. But more than anything, like players are going to be really pissed off with this. And you get a few text messages that night. Sorry to see that friendy, no worries, mate. And then silence, your phone just stops. And, yeah. and then you realise that, Players have moved on to the next bloke who's come in and you just become irrelevant. Yeah. And it gave me real perspective on, you know, at the end of the day, you're just, you're there for your time. And when your time is up, you're out, get it, you know, move on. Um, so it was a really good lesson to learn. I was sacked a second time 
2009, 2011, I think it was. But at that time, um, similar, I didn't see that coming. But we had another personal uh, event had happened in our lives. My wife had been had, had, had suffered a, a really bad injury. So at the time, um, I didn't care. I actually did not care. And in fact, uh, I'll never forget the phone call to the CEO the night before saying, listen, we'd like you to resign <clears throat> or you're going to get sacked. I said, I'm not resigning, mate. I've done nothing wrong. In my mind, I've done nothing wrong. So if you want to sack me, you can sack me. Don't want to look good on your resume, friend. So I couldn't give two hoots. Like, I'm not, I'm not stepping down for anything. But if you want to sack me, you know, have some balls and do it. So he did the next day, sack me. Um, and it was honestly fine. I was like, sweet, move on to the next thing, which was focused on my wife. So I had a year off coaching and we just focused on her and, and getting her right. And uh, in the end, I was really thankful that that actually happened to me. Mm-hmm. Kind of on the flip side then, uh, your biggest achievement so far in your career? Um, I'm going to say connections and it's going to sound really weird but yeah we've won i've won things um but it's not about the winning like I, i'll share this here i got a random text uh two weeks ago wake up because australia's on a different timeline as a as a text and it's from an ex-player and it was just it was just lengthy text just saying um thinking of, of you the other day when he started this business just wanted to thank you for all the the learnings you gave us and all the things i can now see why you're doing this i can see why you're doing that um, and, and so on and so forth. And they're the touching moment. They're, to me, they're the big successes, right, where yeah. you know you've had an impact in a positive way on someone's life. Now, you often don't hear about those, but every now and then you'll get a, a random text like that or you'll be walking down the street and someone will stop you and go, I just want to say thanks. You know, you coach my son or you coach my, my nephew or my grandkid or whatever it was, and from that he's learned this, this and this, and you go, oh, wow, that's really positive. So that would be my biggest achievement is is having a, a positive influence and impact on on, on young people's lives um, that has a lasting effect. Brilliant. Looking back, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Slow down. Okay. It doesn't have to happen tomorrow. And, uh yeah, I, that, that's exactly what it would be. I think you know, I was in a rush. I think like most ambitious, competitive people are, um, you know, I was in a rush for things to happen. But uh, as I said, as life goes on and, and you, you know, certain things happen to you in your life. The, the injury to my wife was, was by far the biggest life-changing moment for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that puts everything in perspective that all of a sudden, you know, um, life can just change like that. So yeah. Yeah, we, we, we work on the saying, you probably heard it, but um, yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, just stop and live in today. And, and, and there couldn't be a truer word spoken, actually. Brilliant. Uh, who would be your dream dinner guest and why? Nelson Mandela. Okay. Uh, and why? I, I've just had a fascination with that man for for a long, long time. I just, I just admired um, everything he stood for. And his capacity to get through hardship, he's 27 years in, in prison and still come out with a smile on his face and, you know, and, and, uh, and still um, have the views that he had. I just thought he was a really special human being. So he, he, would, be, he would be one. Um, I've just started reading the Billy Conley book. He'd be, he'd be fascinating to sit down with. Uh, listen, there'd be a million of them. But Nelson Mandela is the first boat that springs to my mind. Brilliant. Last question before I let you go. Uh, if your life was a book, what chapter would this be called? Oh, um, how long is the book? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'll call it chapter 52 because I'm okay. 52 years of age. How about that? And yeah. hopefully, the cha- hopefully the book goes for 80 chapters. That'd be lovely. Brilliant. Look, Andy, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed that. I actually got a lot from it as well. I've loads of notes here. I just want to wish you the very best of luck moving forward and I'm really looking forward to keeping in touch and keeping up with the season. Good on you all. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Good question. A massive thank you to Andy for joining me today. I thoroughly enjoyed our chat and I personally took a lot of notes and different lessons away from the conversation. If you did enjoy the episode, I really appreciate you could leave a rating and a review as it does help the show grow. Check out the website thesideonelive.com for more and subscribe to our newsletter using the link in the description box below. Thanks as always for listening and I'll catch you in the next one.